Hello, I'm Aaron Rutkoff. I'm the executive editor of Bloomberg Green, and I'm here today with Dr. Michael Mann, a distinguished professor of atmospheric sciences at Penn State University, and I'm really glad we could have someone like Dr. Mann here to talk to us at uh, Bloomberg Green's first live event. Uh, Dr. Mann is not only one of the United States' most accomplished climate scientists, but he's probably been one of the most attacked over the years. Um, he's documented his experience as both a scientist and a communicator to policymakers and the public in his books, the next of which is coming out in January. It's called uh, The New Climate War, uh, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. Uh, he's also recently been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he got his start uh, measuring uh, a millennium's worth of uh, global temperature data from tree rings. Um, and, uh, and like I said, he's for years been one of the go-to people uh, that uh, Congress brings in to, to answer questions about climate change. And so now I'd like to just jump right in by asking Dr. Mann, uh, if, if you could, to discuss what we're seeing right now, or what we have been seeing for the past couple weeks on the west coast of the United States with the wildfires there. Uh, it seems it's finally cleared up today, but I think for many people, what we've been witnessing has been worse than uh, than, than many people expected, even, even people who take seriously uh, the threat of climate change. So uh, what, what should we be learning from what we've seen on the West Coast over the past couple of weeks? Yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron. It's great to be here with you. And thanks to the Bloomberg uh, operation for making this conversation possible. Um, so, you know, it is a, a very interesting time to be having this conversation because we are literally watching the impacts of climate change play out in real time on our television screens and our newspaper headlines and our social media feeds, whether it's these wildfires out west, uh, which are part of a, a pattern. They haven't happened in isolation. Uh, we have seen unusual warmth and, and drought uh, in that region, um, and there has been a trend in that direction for decades. Uh, there has been an increase of nearly uh, fivefold in the area of fire burned every year. Um, out west in the western United States. And we know that that is associated with warmer and drier conditions that are caused by climate change. I actually saw the same thing happen earlier this year when I was on, uh, when I was on sabbatical down in Australia, and they too were witnessing unprecedented heat and drought. And it's, you know, it's not rocket science. You take unprecedented heat, you combine it with unprecedented drought, you're going to have a lot more fuel uh, for these sorts of wildfires. And that's what we're seeing play out. Um, and ironically, as that is playing out on the West Coast, we have yet another landfalling hurricane that is just uh, making landfall now. Uh, it is likely to re uh, lead to record flooding um, in uh, parts of the Gulf Coast because of how slow moving it is, how warm those waters are, which means there's more moisture in the atmosphere. You put that all together and you get these more devastating hurricanes during what is likely to be the most active hurricane season on record. And we wouldn't be seeing any of this if not for human caused climate change. So I want to invite anybody who has questions for Dr. Mann to use the live event app, and I'll be sure to uh, ask him those as we continue. My first question to you is when we're, we're seeing fires at a scale like this that are so much bigger even than the large fires we saw in 2018, what should we expect to see in terms of the impact on carbon dioxide levels? Is this going to meaningfully change what had up to now been a somewhat lower year for emissions as a result of the pandemic? Well, it's probably not enough to make much of a, a dent in those global carbon emissions. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you know, in those bushfires earlier this year in Australia, Australia tripled their carbon emissions for the year. The bushfires released twice as much carbon as all of fossil fuel burning in Australia for that entire year. And these uh, wildfires out west right now are releasing similar amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And so it certainly doesn't help. And if you look at the projections um, as subtropical regions, large parts of North America, Eurasia, Australia get drier and hotter, we expect more of these massive uh, wildfires. Uh, we expect more wildfires in places like the Amazon. And ultimately, that will start to play a role. It will lead to even greater accumulation of carbon pollution in the atmosphere. We call it a positive feedback but that's not a good thing. It's not like the positive feedback you get from your boss for doing a good job. It's an amplifying effect. It means you get even more carbon in the atmosphere, so you get even more warming, and it begins this vicious cycle. More warming and more drying means more wildfires and so on. So it is alarming um, that we're seeing this at this early 
uh, you know, a, a point in sort of our the, our climate evolution, the climate models that we use to project the future, didn't see us being this far along with many of these impacts so early. And, and what it tells us is that we do have a crisis on our hands. Does the fact that we're seeing an impact like this ahead of schedule, ahead of what models might have forecast previously, does it call into question some of the solutions that people have galvanized around? Uh, you know, one of the big ones that's uh, talked about from everyone from the IPCC to people at Davos is planting trees. I mean, does a hotter, drier future with this kind of uh, tendency towards big burnings uh, raise questions about whether uh, uh, tree planting programs can work? Yeah, thanks for asking that, Aaron. And, and this is sort of, there's an extensive discussion of this very matter in, in my new book, in the new climate war, um, uh, in the context of sort of techno fixes and various solutions that have been promoted. Um, you know, the most obvious solution is to stop what's creating this problem, the burning of fossil fuels for transportation, energy, et cetera. And yet we seem to be a society that is always uh, preoccupied with sort of techno fixes, technical solutions. And one of them that really isn't so technical, right, is just planting lots of trees, uh, massive reforestation and afforestation, taking regions that weren't forested and making them forested. And, you know, if you crunch the numbers, um, uh, at best, that would make a bit of a dent in our carbon emissions, maybe reduce them by 30 percent. So we could uptake maybe enough carbon to reduce current carbon emissions by about 30 percent. That means that 70 percent of that carbon would still be accumulating in the atmosphere and warming the planet. We've got to get to zero emissions. And so reforestation, afforestation, sort of natural carbon um, burial methods um, can help at the margins. But none of that is going to make any difference if we don't reduce our burning of fossil fuels, if we don't stem this problem at its source. So on the broader question of where we are in the schedule of what, what kind of climate impacts we expect to see, I was wondering if you could answer for us. You know, It's often a question I'm asked at how far along we are in terms of global average warming. Are we at below one degree, around one degree? And I think a lot of people experience this as a kind of ticking clock since we are now aiming to keep uh, keep warming below two degrees or 1.5 degrees. So if, if, when you're asked the question where we are right now, uh, what, what answer do you give people? Yeah, so my co-authors and I actually uh, published some work related to that question a few years ago. And what we argued is that uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which puts out these major international climate reports every five years, they represent sort of the consensus of the world's scientists, although consensus is sort of a bottom line, it's a common denominator. And, and often those reports are fairly conservative in their assumptions. And we argued that the report was being too conservative in how it measured the warming that has happened so far. They sort of take as their baseline the late 1800s. That's as far back as the thermometer records go, at least at a global scale. But we know that we were already warming the planet for at least a century earlier than that um, from uh, burning uh, deforestation and the burning of fossil fuels. And so to really get a, a, a true pre-industrial baseline, you've got to go back further. You've got to go back into the 1700s. And there are ways to do that with sort of the sparser temperature data that are available or using climate models where we can, you know, reconstruct you know, the, the precise change in climate that we would expect given the factors at play. Um, and those methods suggest that we're probably more than what the IPCC says. Uh, IPC says we're about 1 to 1.1 1 .1, 1 degree Celsius warming of the planet roughly thus far. We're probably closer to 1.2. Now, that sounds like we're sort of, um, you know, uh, debating small details, um, but it makes a huge difference if we're trying to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's a little less than three degrees Fahrenheit, and we've already warmed not one, but 1 1.2, it means there's even less wiggle room, only 0 0.3 degrees Celsius to work with. And if you crunch the numbers, that means we might have as much as 50% less carbon left to burn to keep us under that warming limit. So it has some pretty profound implications for how quickly and how much we have to reduce our carbon emissions over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. A question from the audience now about uh, things that impact warming. Uh, the question is if the new solar cycle is going to influence global heating and what we can expect from that. Yeah, so again, it is an area of the science where I've uh, done 
fair amount of research, um, uh, published a number of articles looking at the impact of uh, changes in solar output on climate. And with these you know, small but measurable changes in the brightness of the sun from one decade to the next or even one century to the next, uh, we find that, you know, those changes can lead to a 0.1, maybe a 0.2 degrees Celsius change in global temperature. And what we're looking at right now is an order of magnitude larger than that. We're at 1.2, headed towards 2, 3, 4, if we don't, you know, uh, get our, uh, you know, fossil fuel burning um, under control. And so those are tiny changes. In fact, a colleague of mine, Stefan Ramstorff, a leading scientist from Germany, published an article a few years ago where they showed the effect that a grand solar minimum, if we saw a, a very substantial decrease, you know, half a percent, but for solar variations, that's large. Um, as we saw back in a period during the early 1600s that called the Maunder minimum, when, when there were no sunspots observed, and when we think solar output you know, was reduced a fair amount, maybe as much as a half a percent, which is pretty large. Um, that, you know, if you look at the effect that that sort of phenomenon would have today, if we had another grand, grand solar minimum, and you plot that on the temperature projections uh, that follow from continued fossil fuel burning, the solar effect is just a small blip you can you can fairly see. It's complete, it, barely see, it's completely dwarfed by the warming caused by the burning of fossil fuels. So it's real, um, it's measurable. It can have a more substantial impact on regional climate patterns because we think it can actually change the behavior of the jet stream. The, the uh, reduction in solar output can actually change the pattern of the jet stream that, for example, gives you a cold winter in, in Europe like we saw during the Little Ice Age um, uh, very often. Uh, those regional effects can be larger, but global temperature changes, it's dwarfed by the warming caused by us, by fossil fuel burning. So when we think about how close we are getting to some of the targets that we've set out in the Paris Accords or the IPCC, like the 1.5 target, uh, in your book, you talk about having to address people who have taken on, who, who believe in climate change, but also have absorbed a sense of almost defeatism. I, at one point, you write about uh, climate champions who portray catastrophe as a fiat accompli. Uh, so how, how do you as a communicator walk that fine line between communicating urgency, but that they're, you know, as I understand your writing, there's you you argue there's plenty of time left for us to be making positive change. So how do you, how do you strike that right balance between those two positions? Uh, thanks. It's a great question, and uh, I would just qualify it. I'm not sure plenty of time. <laughs> We've got to get going now um, if we're going to you know uh, accomplish this task. Uh, and so there's sort of a, a dual messaging when I talk about the climate crisis, um, and it consists of really two words: urgency and agency. There is great urgency. Um, I didn't go through the numbers, but um, the precise numbers, but basically we've got to reduce our carbon emissions by a factor of two within the next decade if we are going to limit warming below that dangerous one and a half degrees Celsius, roughly three degree Fahrenheit uh, warming level. That requires a substantial reduction in fossil fuel burning. It's going to require um, very bold climate policies. And, and maybe we'll see that um, in a not too distant future here in the United States. We have an upcoming election. Depending on the direction that election goes, we could actually see some fairly bold climate policy at the presidential and the congressional level um, over the next few years. And we can still reduce carbon emissions uh, enough to avoid, to avert uh, a catastrophic warming, again, of more than one and a half degrees Celsius. But that window of opportunity is shrinking, and we really need to act now. And so one of the threats, in, in my view, as we move away from outright denialism of climate change, there's still some of that. Our president essentially just denied uh, the the uh, impacts of human caused climate change, the, the 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 role that they're having, for example, with these uh, wildfires. Just the other day, he also even seemed to literally call into question human caused climate change itself. Um, there's a little bit of that a residual denialism, but mostly we've seen sort of the forces of delay and inaction move on from outright denial because the impacts are just too obvious to the person on the street. We can see them out our window. We know something's happening. So instead, it's, well, you know, it's, um, yeah, it may be happening, but it's not going to be that bad. Or, you know, there are other ways to accomplish um, climate, you know, uh, mitigation, planting trees, et cetera, sort of distracting us from the, the true systemic solutions. Or 
fomenting doom and gloom. Um, there are you know, people of goodwill who are honestly uh, very discouraged and depressed about climate change. That's very understandable. Unfortunately, they've been weaponized. Uh, the forces of inaction have exploited that and played on that by sort of leading people down this path of, of despair and despondency that essentially ends up arriving at the same location as outright denial. If you really believe it's too late to do anything about this problem, it leads you down the same path of, of inaction as outright denial of climate change. So it's a real threat right now. I would argue it's as much a threat as outright climate change denial. And there are polls that back that up. There are polls that suggest that more people uh, are not bullish on climate action because they think it's too late to do anything than are not supportive of climate action because they think it's not happening. So let's fast forward now and assume that we're facing in January a changed political posture in the United States. As someone who's often brought in to speak to Congress about uh, what, how to understand climate change and what the policy response should be, what would you want to see in a first 100 days if we were dealing with uh, you know, a, a Washington, D.C. that was uh, approaching climate action with a sense of drive and purpose? Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, first thing I'd like to see would be a friendlier reception for those testimonies. But uh, no, I, in fact, uh, we're already moving that direction. Um, the House of Representatives, the current um, Democratic-controlled uh, House of Representatives, set a number of very substantial um, and, uh, and, 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 and productive uh, hearings over the past few years about climate change and, and climate action. Um, in the first 100 days, I would like to see an agenda where, you know, uh, both houses of Congress, um, the House Democrats have their climate plan. It's a bold plan. The uh, House, uh, the, the Senate Democrats now have their own climate plan. It's a bold plan. Uh, the Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has a bold climate plan. But the plans aren't identical. Um, and they support sort of different avenues, different approaches. So we're going to need to sort of um, take the best ideas from each of those plans and find common ground so that we can push forward uh, meaningful climate policy within the, the first 100 days. We need to see action immediately. This is not a problem that allows for further delay. We have lost too much ground over the last four years simply because of the inaction on the part of the Trump administration and, in fact, the dismantling of climate-friendly policies by the Trump administration. So we have to stop the hemorrhaging and then we have to move forward quickly because we're four years further down the road. And you know, just saying, oh, we're going to maintain our commitments to Paris isn't enough. We've got to go well beyond those Paris commitments now, us and the rest of the world, if we're going to avert catastrophic warming of this planet. So one question that uh, I think you often get asked and that I would love to hear you address for the audience is, given uh, the, the urgency that you express and the, um, the amount of time that we have left, uh, I, I think as I read you, you take a sort of dim view of calls for individual action, that we can make changes that are meaningful on the scale of the climate problem simply by changing some part of our consumer behavior. Uh, it, what's your advice to people who want to engage with this? Is it is there anything beyond voting for a particular candidate uh, that can make a difference at the individual level? Yeah, thanks. No, I would definitely, um, uh, I want to be uh, as clear as possible on this. Um, individual action is important, and we should all do those things that we can do to minimize our environmental uh, and, and our climate uh, you know, uh, footprint. Um, many of those things uh, save us money, they make us healthier. Uh, they set a great example for our friends, family, other people. So there's just so many good reasons to do that. What we can allow is sort of this industry-funded deflection campaign that attempts to make us think that that is the solution, that that's the only thing that we need, that it's all about individual behavioral change. No, individual behavioral change is important, but there's no way we will achieve the reductions in carbon emissions we need without decarbonizing our economy. And we as individuals can't do that. We need politicians who are willing to support policies that um, you know, price carbon, that uh, provide incentives for renewable energy. So we level the playing field in the energy marketplace um, that encourage all of those behaviors that many of us would take anyways, but some people won't if the right incentives aren't in place. We have to make it easier for everybody to make the right decisions, everybody to be carbon friendly or climate friendlier in their behavior. And the only way you really get that is through systemic change and policies that encourage that. So we need both. 
We need individual behavioral change, but it has to be fostered and incentivized by policy, by climate policy at the national level and at the international level. I wonder if you consider what might happen should Trump win in November. What what would that do for people like you are in the role of recommending climate policy or communicating about the problem that we're facing when uh, we would see a return of a president who, as you expressed, uh, uh, often seems to deny that this that this is happening. Yeah, well, I think in that event, uh, extra planetary exploration will become uh, ever more important. Uh, we will need to find another planet. I don't think this one can survive another four years of Donald Trump. And I've said that before, and I'll, and I'll say it again. And, and I literally uh, believe that um, when it comes to the greatest crisis we face, uh, we have been able to withstand with, you know, some damage uh, to our efforts to, you know, uh, address the climate crisis. We've been able to withstand four years, but I don't think we or this world can withstand another four years of Trump's policies of outsourcing environmental policy to the polluters um, and uh, is, is sabotaging international climate agreements um, by threatening to pull out and collaborating with other petro states to sabotage international climate policy. We, we can't allow for another four years of that. And so I don't even want to think about that scenario. Um, uh, it's 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 not a scenario any of us uh, should uh, consider acceptable. Um, it is essential. And look, don't just listen to me. Scientific American, which is our most prestigious scientific publication in this country, for 175 years has never taken a, a partisan political position on a presidential election. But yesterday they came out for Joe Biden because they recognize the fundamental threat that another four years of Trumpism would pose to civilization writ large, but to the pressing problems we face, whether it be coronavirus or the even larger looming crisis, climate change. So we have just a few minutes left, and I want to try to make sure we leave it in a, a somewhat less uh, grim and more optimistic place. So <laughs> I guess I, I would love to know, you know, in, against the backdrop of, uh, you know, the very active Atlantic hurricane season, the storms on the West Coast, the permafrost melting and the record temperatures we've seen, I wonder if you think in some, in, in, if there's any ways we can see progress now over, say, when you first introduced the hockey stick graph or you first began working. Is there any way that our understanding or our policy approach to dealing with climate change has improved from your early days in this field? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that's the good news. And, and, and I do want us to close uh, in talking about the reasons that I am cautiously optimistic. First of all, I do think the election will go in the right direction. I, I do think we will have a much more um, uh, a favorable uh, political atmosphere um, a year from now, uh, less than a year from now for, for climate action here in the United States. And, and that sets the stage for, for global climate action because everybody's looking to the United States um, for, for leadership and we need to provide that. And I think we'll be in a position to do that, but it's, it's the kids, it's the youth climate movement, it's uh, Greta Thunberg um, and the other children, millions of them who've been marching in the streets, striking from school to raise awareness for a problem that literally threatens their future. And I think that they have recentered this conversation where it needs to be. It's not just about science and policy and politics and economics, it's about ethics. What sort of world do we wanna leave behind for our children and grandchildren? Now look, we've gone through some important tipping points, not the scary climate tipping points that we fear, but societal tipping points of the good kind in recent years on marriage equality. I think we're going through one right now on racial equality. I think we're, we're, we're going through a societal tipping point where there's a fundamental shift in, in how we view matters of uh, racial justice and racial equality. And because of that, I'm confident that we could be very close to having a similar moment on climate change, crossing that tipping point in the public consciousness and demanding accountability of our policymakers and having policymakers in place who will be willing to uh, act on this problem. So for all of those reasons, despite how bad things might look out the window when you look at uh, the, the Western US is on fire and the Eastern US is bombarded by super storms um, and we have a climate change denying president. Despite all of that, I actually think that a few months from now, we might be in a much better place and there still really is the agency. There's the urgency, but there is the agency. There is the opportunity to solve this problem in time.
Now, looking back at your career involved in climate communication and the uh, attacks that you've endured, which are, are similar to the, some of the young activists you cite, are now enduring. Do, right. do you have advice for the, uh, the rising generation of climate leadership and how to deal with the kind of uh, assault you've been under? And I, I'm particularly curious if, if anything about how you've communicated has changed in the decades since your uh, email communication was hacked, which almost seems like a forerunner to a lot of the email hackings we saw in the last presidential election. So it, it, what's your advice to people who are just entering the fray? Yeah, I mean, I would give them advice, but I don't think they need much. I think the children are leading the way right now, and they're gutsy, and they're not afraid to speak truth to power, and they've got thick skins, and they're not getting intimidated. Um, again, it's part of why I'm so, uh, you know, uh, cautiously uh, optimistic. Um, but what I would say was, you know, be true, would be be true to your ideals, um, to uh, don't worry about, you know, Yes, you'll be attacked um, if you speak truth to power. Um, grow a thick skin, recognize you're part of a large group and there are a lot of supporters out there who are willing to help you and that's true today in the scientific community in a way that it wasn't when I first got started. Uh, the scientific community really has recognized the importance of providing support and protection for scientists who are willing to speak truth to power and to, are willing to get into the fray when it comes to uh, larger conversations about uh, policy relevant science. There's so much support now today. Um, and there's so much engagement. Uh, young folks uh, no longer have an obstacle to engaging the larger public. You can, you know, there's no longer um, the, the sorts of hurdles that we used to have. Um, you've got social media. You can speak directly to people. Uh, people are growing up in an environment where communication is, is natural extension of how we lead our lives. And that's leading to a generation of scientists that is not afraid to get into the fray. And that's part, again, part of why I'm encouraged. I, I do think we will win this battle because we've got truth on our side, scientific truth on our side. And we've got a lot of gutsy people out there now who are willing to, um, to fight the good fight. In your book, you trace some of the disinformation that you've had to address throughout your time as a climate scientist and communicator to the oil industry itself, and and I, you know, that's been written about extensively. Uh, when you look at the oil companies now who are coming out with these plans, like BP this week, saying that uh, oil demand has peaked and they're going to slash a billion barrels of production while increasing the renewable output dramatically, does that? Do you, do you uh, react to that with skepticism? Do you see them as kind of part of the good fight now? How do, how do you, how should we read oil companies in this moment? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'd like to think of them as energy companies. They have to uh, see themselves as energy co uh, companies. Um, if you're going to survive in the 21st century, you have to recognize that the age of fossil fuels is going to come to an end. And those companies that uh, embrace that and realize that if they get out ahead, on renewable energy, on the renewable energy transition. They're gonna be the leaders in the future. And some companies, some uh, energy companies or formerly oil companies, of course, BP, British Petroleum, for a time was calling themselves beyond petroleum uh, back in the 2000s. Um, and that was when they were trying to move in this direction. Then we had the Gulf oil spill. Uh, it was B BP's fault and they sort of lost any street cred that they might've had as being the environmental oil company. Now they're, they're talking a good game once again but um, we have to measure them by their actions and we have to uh, hold them accountable. And, and policy is the way to do that. Um, sure, it's great that they're saying good things, but we are going to need uh, governmental policies that force energy companies to do the right thing, that put in place the incentives that will naturally lead them in the direction that we know we need to go. The decarbonization of our energy and, and in transportation and societal infrastructure um, and embracing green, uh, renewable, clean, climate-friendly energy. That's the solution, and we have to make sure that uh, energy producers are willing to, um, to be part of the solution rather than continuing to be part of the problem. Well, Dr. Mann, I, I thank you so much for making the time to speak with us today. I, I want to remind people that his new book is coming out in January called The New Climate War, and, and really thank you so much for being part of our first event. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.